Let's read it together. I'll read beginning with Psalm 32, a psalm of David. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. But he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness, shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before your throne of grace only because you are the one who can take away our sin. That we can come before you receiving grace and you hear our prayers. And we ask that you would teach us today through your word what it means to walk openly before you, to not hide our sin, but to know your grace and your loving kindness. Bless us as we hear, as we learn, and make us more like Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So what do you do with sin? It's a question where we might know what the answer should be, but it's not always worked out that way in our lives. Of course, you might think when I ask that question, what does reminding us of sin have to do with happiness? Typically, we think of happiness as as when we put away negative thoughts and get rid of guilt feelings. Certainly, there's some truth to that. But there's a number of wrong ways that we often try to handle sin and, and the feelings of guilt that we have from real sin. Sometimes, we just try harder to do good and do good works. We can pacify our consciences by maybe doing some kind deed towards others or or giving a generous donation. Maybe we attend a a few church services. We're feeling down, so we come in and we get some religion. Even though we don't pay a lick of attention, we feel more spiritual because we've come. It's an interesting thing that sometimes we act like our spiritual activities cancel out our sin can silence our conscience if we think that way. Maybe another way is we just try avoid guilt feelings by blaming others. It's not really my fault. It's what someone else did to me. That's why I got angry. Or maybe it was the way I brought up. Or, or, or maybe it's because of my health or my economic situations. What someone else did to me. And as long as it's someone else's fault, I don't have to feel guilty. I can always point the finger elsewhere. Or others deal with guilt, just trying to reject God's standard, what God says. I, I don't believe in God. Or, or I reinterpret the Bible so that it doesn't quite land on me as hard, and that's, that's antiquated. It doesn't really apply, and we've progressed since then, and now I don't have to feel quite as guilty. Or maybe we stuff it. We just try and move on, and we fill our lives with the busyness of things, drown out the memory of the sin and the guilt. And really, all of these are ways of covering up, hiding sin, a way to try and take care of it on my own without looking to the Lord. That's what David tried to do. He says, when I kept silent about my sin, I tried to hide it. 
and it didn't go well for him. He refused to deal openly and honestly with God, and he wouldn't face it. It was hard. Now, the Bible agrees that it is good to be free of guilt. It also says that we're all guilty before a holy God. But the approach to dealing with it's radically different than those ways or the world's ways. Now, in our psalm here, by God's grace, we see that David's conscience isn't so completely seared that he never ends up dealing with his sin. Actually, he learned to deal with it God's way. And that's what he teaches us in this psalm. He shares with us there is a a true approach of finding happiness, the only true happiness, and it's found in a right relationship with God and delighting in him. And what he shows us is that the only way that we can have a right relationship with our maker, with our God, is by him granting us forgiveness for our sin because we've come seeking mercy and confessed our sin. And so happy, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy is the man that the Lord doesn't count iniquity. Our psalm starts with. Through this psalm, he elaborates on this progress from how we got from sin to happiness. And we're going to look at that under four aspects, four moves through this psalm. And we're going to look at just recognizing, confessing, learning, and rejoicing. Recognizing, confessing, learning, rejoicing. That's what we're going to talk through. And our our goal here is to learn from David the the way to true happiness, to learn how to deal with our sin rightly, true blessing, and, and to put away the foolishness of trying to hide our sin from God and others. So let's look at the first one, recognizing. And and what David is recognizing is his own resistance and the harm that comes from it. We started Psalms a number of weeks ago with Psalm 1, which is another psalm that starts out with happy is the man. It talks about happiness. In Psalm 1, it spoke about the person who was blessed, the one who's happy, is the one who doesn't go the way of the world. It's the one who seeks to live holy, different than the world, delighting in God's ways. He meditates on his word day and night, and it shapes who he is. And, and, and when this happy man lives in God's ways, he's fruitful in his life. He has endurance. He has eternal joy shaping him, eternal joy with his maker. So really, it's saying happy is the man who is righteous. But what do you do if you've blown it? When you haven't walked in his ways, you've done wickedly, and you've sinned like each and every one of us has. We could give up and give in. I've already blown it, right? I'm already guilty before my money, so we'll just continue, eat, drink, and be merry because this is all the joy I'm going to get in this life. Or maybe I hide my sin and act like nothing happened. That's another way. So here's David, a man who knew God's ways. As the king of Israel, he had to write the the law of the Lord. He knew what was right and wrong. He knew better. But when he blew it, when he sinned against his God, he just got himself in deeper and deeper. It started out with him neglecting his duties. Now there's an account of David when he sinned in 2 Samuel and We don't know if it's the same account that's referred to here, but this is an account of hidden sin. And in 2 Samuel, he should have never stayed home that day when he should have been out with his troops like kings should do. And when he stayed home, he should have never lingered on his rooftop looking at the woman across the way bathing. He shouldn't have sent for her. He knew She was another man's wife, and he certainly shouldn't have been with her in the way that only a husband should be with his wife. But he went across all those boundaries that he knew he shouldn't have do, and this woman, Bathsheba, conceived. What do we do with sin? What do we do with sin when it gets us in a mess, when it could cost us our reputation and 
how others would look at us, that we could lose our status, our power, our authority. David tried to cover it up. So he had this sin, but then he sent for Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, from the battlefield to try and make it look like it wasn't his child, but Uriah's child. Well, that didn't work. And so he conspired to have Uriah killed, and then he took Bathsheba as his wife. He should have confessed it. He didn't. He kept silent about it. He stuffed it. He tried to move on with things. But, but months later, and maybe up to a year after the child was born, God didn't let him go. The Lord sent a prophet named Nathan to David to tell of a rich man who, who went and stole the lamb of a poor man, his only little ewe lamb, who was like a child to him. And, of course, the rich man had many, many sheep. And instead of being content with his own, when a visitor came, he went and took this poor man's lamb. David heard the story. He was outraged. This man should die. Nathan said to David, you are that man. So David was exposed. No excuses this time. No covering. And he cries out, I have sinned against the Lord. Psalm 51 is a psalm which captures his confession at that time when he was confronted by Nathan. Again, we don't know about Psalm 32. Many think Psalm 32 is talking about the same occasion. But in any case, Psalm 32 reflects the burden of unconfessed sin and the hope and release that can come from forgiveness. Maybe you haven't sinned the way David did in adultery and murder and so many other things. Or maybe you have. Maybe you've been involved in an affair or you have secret sins of lusts that you hide. Maybe you've been, been involved in an abortion. You've been abusive towards others. Or maybe your sins are more subtle anger and greed and selfishness and pride. It's not unlike how David got into sin in that account in 2 Samuel where he didn't attend to the things that the Lord would have him. And, and, and he was deceived into thinking that going after some of these things which God forbid would give him satisfaction and joy, but the fleeting sh- pleasures of sin didn't lead him to that. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life doesn't take us towards God. It always takes us away. How do we even measure the consequences of such sins? Not only to others, but but to ourselves, the hardening that can come in our own souls and conscience, especially if we've, we've never confessed it. David came to recognize some of the harm that comes from unconfessed sin. Verse 3 says, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning. All day long, there was a, an inner hurt which worked out in, in this groaning. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality, my strength, literally my juice was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. So David's looking back on his sin and when he was unconfessed and he's he's commenting on it and he he saw a clear connection between two things. First, his resistance. He kept silent about his sin and, and the distress that came from it. Physical and mental anguish. So some think this description is more metaphorical about his spiritual, mental anguish, but it seems that he's feeling symptoms even in his body. He's, he's drained. There's, there's no energy. He's, he's dried up like a withered plant. Maybe some of you have felt that way. We know there's a connection between body and soul. The, the proverb speaks often of uh, this connection a joyful heart at one level is good medicine. When we're lifted up, it can be healing to our bones. But a broken spirit dries up the bones, Proverbs 17 says. The way we think can affect our bodies, and our bodies can affect the way we think. God made us as whole beings, and we understand that that happens. 
and you bottle up something like sin in your soul like David, it can leak out and be rottenness to your body. It affects how you feel. Now, of course, that's not always the case. We know there's many causes to bodily distress. But we understand that unconfessed sin can wear us down. Something was very out of kilter for David in his life. And it wasn't just in his head. Notice verse 4 what it said. The Lord's hand was heavy upon him. It was actually God laying his hand upon David, leaning on him to make him feel the weight of his sin. Here's David trying to hide his sin. And of course, God knows about our sin. He knows all that we do. We can't hide from him. And God won't let his children go. See, this is grace. Some of you are familiar with Hebrews chapter 12. And it talks about God's discipline. And he says, for, for what son is there whom his father doesn't discipline him? Actually, if you're left without discipline, you're illegitimate children. You're not his son. So it's part of his care to bring the weight of our wrong on us and, and discipline to turn us from it if we're his. And, and actually, we should worry if the, we have unrepentant sin in our lives and there's no consequences. Illegitimate. Or maybe, if there's unrepentant sin in our lives, we should look at the consequences that might be there and say, Lord, what are you telling me? Again, we understand that the wrong isn't always a result of sin. Jesus teaches that. Job teaches us that. Sometimes bad things happen in a fallen world. But because God loves his children, he does correct us and uses discipline. You see, God knows that we can't fully love him without dealing with our sin. He knew that for David. We can go around and say, oh, I, I'm doing fine with the Lord when we've, we've rebelled against him. And, 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 and how do we act like something's fine? We're not loving him. It's hypocrisy. It's like saying you love your wife when you're having an affair or you're abusing her all the time. And then telling everyone how great your marriage is. It's a sham. Or like David. Here he is, the king of Israel, and supposed to be leading as the representative of God to the people. And he's rebelled against the Lord. We can be like that sometimes. On our own, no one really likes to admit that we've failed. We've sinned, we've done wrong. It can be so discomforting. So, so at one level, maybe we can identify with David. David and his pride. What's the outworking of those things? David's still ruling as king. What's his worship like in the temple when he goes to see the priests and others worshiping? What's it like with us? Our relationships, when we're, we're hiding unrepentant sin, can become very superficial. We don't really let people in, or, or if we do let them in, we only let them in at a, at a very top level. Maybe we, we throw a bone, we think, oh, I'm, I'm struggling with this little thing, and we hide the big thing. And people think how real we are because we talk about these things. But meanwhile, we just cover up the real sin that gnaws away at us. Now, that type of interaction isn't about real repenting. It's not about radical change. It's, it's still hiding. And what we need is discipline, a heavy hand, maybe a Nathan in our lives to to bring us to recognize, like David, how foolish he was in his resistance. Actually, that's that's why verse 9 is in there. He's like, don't be like a stubborn mule or, or a horse. They don't have any real understanding. A horse, a mule, they don't do what's right on their own unless they're, they're controlled by a bridle and a bit. David's saying, no, don't be like that, where you don't come willingly to the Lord. David, he didn't come willingly, he hid it. They had a a way of dealing with sin in the Old Testament, right? You go to the priest, you do a sacrifice, you confess. Who knows what the consequences were going to be, but David wasn't willing to go there. He hid his sin. He didn't come to use God's means for restoration like many of us don't. 
We don't come openly confessing our sin to the Lord or, or those that he's put in our lives, one another, our pastors, the body of Christ. We, we hide it. We say, everything's fine. There's only sorrow if we're that way. Verse 10, many are the sorrows of the wicked. Sorrows for those who reject the Lord's ways. Don't be like that. Don't be like the mule. Thankfully, this isn't the end of the story. Yes, we're called to recognize the resistance and the agony of the denial and the harm that comes from it. But we already know the theme of this psalm, verse 1 and 2, is happy are those who can have this sin taken care of. Well, the next point says, how do we get there? It's by confessing. Sometimes when we're unhappy, we can think of all the things that are obstacles to our happiness. When we want the things in our lives to be different, we we tell ourselves, okay, I I can do better at this. I'll deal with the issues. Maybe I'll help point out others' issues since it's usually their fault. But we often omit the one thing that's central to real happiness and real change, and that's confession of our own sin. The Lord's hand was heavy upon David, and it robbed him of his joy. And no real change was going to take place unless it began with confession. This kind of confession, verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I didn't hide. I said I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And he's giving a multifaceted picture of his, his sin and his confession here. Now, now he had hidden it, but somehow he was convicted. In the case of Bathsheba, it was Nathan who confronted him and it stirred up his conscience. And he saw things differently. See, David had a choice when he was confronted. Like, we have a choice when we're confronted, when our sin is exposed. How am I going to respond? Am I going to justify it? Am I going to deny it? Am I going to find happiness in those ways of doing it, or am I going to uncover the sin so that the Lord can cover it for me? David isn't just giving a a fleeting, oh yeah, I sinned, sorry. There's three terms here that he uses in his plea in verse 5. Transgression, sin, iniquity. It shows a a comprehensive view of sin. And by the way, that that matches the same terms in verses 1 and 2, if you'll notice. In transgression, it means means going over the line. It's going over boundaries that have been set where I shouldn't go. And, And it indicates a rebellion. A rebellion against what God has said and what he has established is right and wrong. It says, I'm going my own way. It's not just that I made a mistake in a little boo-boo or an error. It's treason against my maker. It's not that I, I just don't like the consequences. Now David's seen it is against his God. So often when we don't like the consequences, we, we say, I need to turn over a new leaf. Coming to God isn't turning over a new leaf. It's dying to myself and finding my life in him. Now I can really wrestle with sin because now I see sin as something that's against God, not just something that I don't like. He talks about sin here, another term which which we understand is missing the mark. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You've seen the little picture of the arrow not making the target, right? That's what it, it pictures there. We don't measure to God's standard. We don't even measure up to our own standards, let alone God's. And yet, for somehow, in our foolishness, we don't even acknowledge it. We try and hide it. And we we can rationalize, on the other hand, well, nobody measures up. It's okay if nobody measures up, but there is no safety in numbers. Just because everyone else is doing it, it's still sin. It doesn't matter if everyone else is turning upside down God's morality, his view on sexuality, for truth-telling, for self-control. Yeah, we don't like external standards imposed on us because we, we're so independent. But this is reality. We live in God's world. He's the determiner of right and wrong. And David has come to see that he falls short of what God has said. And he also sees his own twistedness. This word iniquity, it means a crookedness, a perversion, a deviation from what's right. 
And it comes from this inner moral distortion we have from the fallenness, which we all have. David says, that's me. We're all twisted and we're going to continue to go astray unless God helps us. David understood the diagnosis of his condition finally. When we say diagnosis, like when a doctor, if he gives a diagnosis, if, if he tells us that we're fine when we're not, it, it's not only not helpful, it can be destructive. But the great physician knows and tells us what is our condition and what's the remedy. The world's remedy is, is just pursue your selfish desires. Try and Quiet your conscience. This is just something that you've been oppressed by and shaped by from your upbringing, but you need to be liberated from that. It's a lie, though. Any remedy for happiness that the world tells us or anyone tells us or we tells ourselves, any remedy that does not have forgiveness at its heart is no remedy at all because we have all sinned. We stand guilty before our Maker. But if we actually come to see this condition that we're in, We know that we're totally dependent on him for the cure. Totally dependent on his kindness for forgiveness and real God-honoring change. So David came to see that, and he abandoned the cover-up. He abandoned trying to deceive himself and God and others. And if you look back at verse 2, this is interesting. It says, blessed is the man in whose spirit there is No deceit, no deceiving. Now listen, this means that the only people who receive this blessing of forgiveness are those whose lives are not a cover-up. There's no deceit. They're coming clean about their sin. They have this kind of open confession. That's what the Lord calls for, is this complete open confession. And just as there were three terms for the multiple facets of sins, there's three terms in verse 5 for for his repentance. He acknowledged it. He was calling sin what it is. He's not hiding it, meaning he's, he's walking transparently. He's confessing it. He's agreeing with what God says about what he's done. And he's putting off the hypocrisy. And when he did... We see the forgiveness. And there's, there's three terms for repentance. There's three terms for sin. But there's also three terms for the forgiveness. He's forgiven. He's covered. The sin's not imputed. God's diagnosis is our sin, but his remedy covers it comprehensively. There's this imagery of forgiven. It's of, of lifted off, of carried away, like, a, like a, a, a big weight grinding us down. Some of you have heard Pilgrim's Progress. We have a children's book with this cover with this guy with this massive pack just being ground down on there. And the picture is when the burden of that is lifted off, how he dances for joy because his sin is gone. And that's, that's the picture here. His sin's also covered. It's hidden from view. God won't bring it up again in a way to stand in the relationship between me and him anymore when it's covered. If I try to cover my sin from him, he has to bring it up. But if I lay it before him, he'll cover it and won't bring it up to bring me down. In this last term, we think of of the term justification. We talk about how we're justified. We can stand blameless before God. It says not imputed, not counted. There's no record kept. There's no debt I owe anymore on, on my ledger when I stand before God. And these things, this covering of my sin, this complete forgiveness, is the basis for me having a happy, blessed life. When the sin that I know I've committed is gone, and I can have fellowship with my maker. And it happens instantly. When I confessed my sin, it doesn't say he made me make it up, do penance, earn it by good works. No, when I confessed it, he forgave me. Instantly. I think of like when, when Jesus heals a leper, He reaches out, he touched him, he's healed. When we confess our sins, if we do it in faith, trusting in in what the Lord's provision is, we can be forgiven. No earning, no paying back. Just turning to the Lord in faith. 
This is what Paul talks about in the New Testament in Romans chapter 4. When he talks about being justified by faith, not works. He quotes Psalm 32. Who's righteous before God? It's not the one who works, but him who believes in him who justifies the ungodly. He justifies sinners. That one, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one whom God counts righteous apart from the works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord won't count his sin. We can stand in a state of being forgiven. The ungodly can be counted as God's people, and we stand righteous before him because of a gift, Paul calls it, to the undeserving, not as a reward. David is happy in his soul, and he wants to share that with others. He he moves then from his personal experience to calling everyone into this same experience, this joy of forgiveness. In verse 6, we move to our next point on learning. David is teaching. He's teaching us how to be happy too. He went from recognizing to confessing. And now how do we get into this? We pray. Therefore, verse 6, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Notice the, the therefore. The therefore is there because David says, as I pray to God, confessing my sin, you do that too. That's what you need to do to be happy. Let everyone pray. And and this is kind of the positive way of saying, don't be like the mule. Don't be stubborn, but come freely in prayer before your God. And here David's addressing the Lord, but his intention is to encourage us in this hope of forgiveness. Apply these truths to your lives. So often when we admit our sin, if we don't have good news at the other side, what does that do except leave us in despair? If I just admit how how feeble I am and how weak and how I can't do it right, it's not uplifting. It doesn't sound happy. But because God is gracious and compassionate, when we pray to him, we are appropriating his grace of forgiveness. There is hope at the end of of admitting that we failed. That's good news. Because we know it's there, he knows it's there, let's deal with it and receive forgiveness. Don't hide it. And there's a sense of urgency to this. Come at a time when he can be found. We know he's always present, God's everywhere. But it's not always that we'll seek him. Our delay might compound the possibility of us going deeper and deeper into sin and hardening our own hearts. David stopped talking to God. He became silent about his sin, it says. He knew it was sin. He became silent about it. So what do we need? It should remind us that we need regular, deliberate, habitual confession before God. It's one of the most healthy practices for our soul, for happiness. We're called to be active in this relationship. We call out in prayer and we say, Father, I've done this today and it was wrong. Forgive me because of Christ. Be specific. And he'll forgive if you're his and you've trusted in him. And we think, what what accounts for God's willingness to do this? I hope the word that's coming into your head his love. It's his love. Look at the second half of verse 10. He who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness will surround him. It will hem him in. Trust in him. Put, put your faith in him enough to confess your sin and be open. And, and he'll surround us with loving kindness. That works out in this blessing of forgiveness. But but not just forgiveness. It also works out in the blessing of protection and guidance. Look at as the promises go on. The rest of verse 6. Surely in a flood of great waters, they're not going to reach him. The one who prays. God is like a high rock that when a flood of adversity comes, he's protected out of reach. 
Verse 7, you are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. The Lord is a, a shelter, a protection from what threatens our soul. So he's calling us to pray. And, and through prayer, what do we do? We're building on our relationship that we have so that when the, the mighty waters of trouble come, we already have established patterns of communications with the Lord. Meaning when it comes, I already know how to call out to him. And I won't be overcome. He won't say I never knew you, but, but even more so, we know we can come to him, right? And if you notice, the coming of trouble, even to the righteous, is assumed. Trouble's going to come. If we live long enough, if we've been around long enough, sooner or later, and what's your foundation going to be? Who's your foundation going to be? And have you established it now in Christ and calling out to the Lord? So, so we have the, the, the blessingness of forgiveness, of, of protection, but also guidance. Look at verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way in which you should go. I will counsel you with, with my eye upon you. He'll be with us. Now, this is, this is probably a speech, an oracle from the Lord that the that David puts in here where the Lord's teaching, and we need to learn, don't we? We need to learn the ways of repentance. We need to learn the ways of following him. How do we do that? Isn't it through his word, his spirit, God's people? We encourage one another. Those are the means that he's given us to learn, to be taught his ways. And and so that's why we see in other places that he calls us, don't lean on your own understanding. Don't go the way of the world to hide your guilt feelings. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. It's part of the happy life. What he's saying here is that good things can happen to bad people because of his grace. So here, just summarizing this point, what what has David learned that he's teaching us? Well, first, the most damaging thing in our life is unconfessed sin. But he also learned that this sin need not be what destroys him because he can run to the Lord. So David rejoices. And that's our last point. He rejoices in these truths and he calls on us to rejoice in the happy life of knowing God. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, verse 11, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. This is a celebration. He's calling us into the celebration of good news. What's another word for good news? Gospel. Gospel means good news. When we talk about the gospel in the context of Christ in the New Testament, a gospel is, is like a, a victory proclamation of, of, a, of a battle that's been won and, and there's a, a, a coming into the celebration of this news of something that's been accomplished. It's done. So the gospel is the good news of what God has done in Christ to secure our salvation. What was pointed to in the sacrifices of the Old Testament that David knew about was the sacrifice we look back to on the cross, which we celebrate today, where Christ was the substitute. He conquered sin and death by what he did on the cross. And it's good news for sinners. And notice it talks about the upright ones and the righteous ones. Now in the context of this song, he's talking about the same people. It's even verse 1. The ones who had sin that was covered and transgression. These are sinners saved by grace. It's not about being perfect They are righteous because they have trusted in the Lord and have been willing to confess their sins openly and completely to him like David in verse 5. You see, there's good news for sinners like you and me that God can justify the ungodly and bring us into his righteousness and not count our iniquity against us. We celebrate today the Lord's Supper Christ commemorated his death and he wanted us to remember. We understand when we partake of this that God can't just wipe the slate clean. He's holy and he needs to punish sin. He he can't look on good and evil the same way he wouldn't be just. 
But the Bible teaches us that if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He's just, not just merciful, he's just to forgive us our sin, and he's just not because we earned it, but because he honors the sacrifice of his son. He sent Christ into the world to do for us what we could never do ourselves. And he counts our sin not against us, but against him. And he did that to bring us to God, to the fellowship, his care, happiness. That's what we celebrate today. Let's be glad in the Lord and rejoice together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before your throne of grace because of Christ. Because you are compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. And you forgive those who put their trust in you. Father, forgive us for we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We haven't loved you with our whole heart or our neighbors, ourselves. We've left so many things undone. We've done so many things wrong. Help us to come clean in our confession. And because of Christ, let us know we can stand clean before you. We pray in his name. Amen.